Episode 82, The Paradox. Welcome to The Paradox with your attending, Dr. Eric Larson. He is a practicing anesthesiologist and clinical assistant professor at Michigan State University College of Human Medicine. Listen in as he takes you behind the scenes of what practicing medicine in today's ever-changing world is like with another doctor. The Paradox is a fun and accidentally informative show for physicians, patients, or anyone who has ever found themselves in a waiting room. Welcome to The Paradox. I'm your host, Dr. Eric Larson. Thank you for joining me as we explore the U.S. medical system in a fun, informative format through expert analysis. And today's episode is going to be one that's on everyone's mind is uh, coronavirus or the COVID-19. It's the pandemic that's spreading around the world. And we're going to discuss this in two parts. The first part is my monologue where I'm going to talk about the coronavirus and what I think is how our response is probably not optimal in the United States uh, and try and keep politics out of it. The second part is the interview I did and will be appearing soon, if not today, on Life, Liberty, and the Pursuit of Snarkiness, where I return again, where we discuss not only the coronavirus and sort of general medical issues, but also the issues of liberty and government restrictions and regulations and how they may affect the coronavirus response uh, with Aaron Pomerantz on that great podcast, which I would highly recommend to you after you finish listening to mine. Be sure to subscribe to Aaron's show. Uh, so let's begin first with coronavirus, COVID-19. It's a novel virus. It's obviously all around the world at this point. Certain countries are having worse problems than others, uh, namely Italy, uh, Iran. It sounds like it's really bad. And then potentially other places in Europe. I'm recording this now on March 17th, 2020. The interview I did earlier was on Saturday, 2020, on March 13th. So in four days, of course, a lot has happened. There have been a national state of emergency declared by President Trump. There's, in the state of Michigan where I reside, we now have all our restaurants and bars closed or only takeout. You're still able to move around freely throughout the area, but you're not allowed to congregate into large groups. Now, by saying that you're not allowed to, you're actually allowed to, but they don't recommend it, and they being government officials. And so I don't think you'd be arrested for holding large gatherings. But at this point, this early in sort of the response, I think it'd be very surprising for anyone to actually do that. Any sort of official capacity, no organization would do this. And so things like churches and schools have been shut down, and they're going to be shut down for a number of weeks, and I'm guessing for quite a while. And when it comes to medical practices, you're seeing... All elective surgeries have been canceled now or virtually canceled. Um, you're seeing uh, lots of offices close. I know from my personal experience, my wife's office, she's a pediatrician. They're down to just six visits and only the rare well visits for children who need immunizations. Every practice has their own policies. I know some allergists have closed their offices and other places have basically closed down. It's causing a massive uh, economic hit. Most Americans don't have much in savings. I probably don't need to tell you that. Uh, whether people can survive two months without pay, I even speak for other physicians. Uh, people live paycheck to paycheck, uh, and they're going to be hurting. And uh, no amount of government assistance is probably going to fix that entirely. Uh, so it'll be interesting to see what transpires from all of this. And I think it's important to consider what the economic impacts are going to be of all these decisions made. And so that's kind of what I want to start this discussion because although I talked about it with Aaron on some level, I've had a little time to reflect. I spoke to my wife about it a little bit as we're sort of discussing the impact of what's happening in the medical practice. Um, I'm an anesthesiologist. About 90% or so of the work we do, maybe even more, is elective work. And so most of that has been shut down. So the, you know our livelihood is pretty much shut down for quite a while, uh, as would most physicians who are surgeons, at least, who are doing elective work. Uh, but a lot of medical care is actually elective as well, unless you're someone who lives in the hospital, like a hospitalist, maybe right, radiologist and others. Uh, a lot of your work is going to be elective. And so when you close all the elective stuff down, there's an, there's an impact and there's people who you know depend on that income, et cetera, et cetera. It's entirely possible that we'll be called to do other things like ICU work and you know depending on sort of the extent of how this thing plays out, uh, you're seeing kind of, you know, nightmare scenarios. You have dermatologists running ICUs and ventilators in Italy where they haven't done that since medical school. I mean, I hope uh, that that is not what it comes to in the United States. I don't think it will. Uh, but anyway, I mean, that's always a possibility. But for now, 
sort of not much is going on. Uh, I think uh, it's difficult without actually seeing a graph in front of you. But if you think about when you hear people talk about flattening the curve, let's talk about that a little bit. Uh, coronavirus is a virus, and it's and it spreads by ha people having it, obviously. And so the more people who have it, the more likely it is to spread, and that's why you get the exponential growth of people who have the infection. Even though most people are asymptomatic, especially the young, uh, there are people who are susceptible to succumbing to the disease. Uh, those are people who are elderly, people with heart disease, immunocompromised. Uh, they're more likely to have problems. I don't have any numbers as far as morbidity, which means what likelihood you have of having long-lasting effects even if you survive the illness. So this would be like, you know, becoming deaf or having heart failure or or significant lung disease and you just can't do things that you used to do and maybe you're more susceptible to getting sick or having problems later on with other things. Uh, so that I just don't think anybody knows. I've not seen any reliable data. It's such a new novel disease. I don't think we're going to know that for at least a, you know six months to a year. Uh, but the long-lasting effects are of those who survive. My guess is most people are going to get the infection and much like this swine flu H1N1 and they'll be basically totally asymptomatic. They'll have an immunity to it, and that'll be sort of it. Uh, there are obviously a lot of people who die from it, uh, and the numbers depend on how old you are and your conditions, but it's significant. It's much worse than the flu. I don't think there's any question about that. Uh, for The only difference is probably for the young, it's maybe even less dangerous than the flu, which is kind of strange. But again, it's really hard to know looking at other countries' data circumstances, et cetera, et cetera, and populations. And so it's hard to know these things for sure, but it certainly looks like overall worse than the flu. And that's why there's kind of this freak out you know, throughout the world. And <clears throat> what you want to think about with the virus is you want to get herd immunity, right? We talk about those vaccinations. Uh, you need to have a certain percent of the population that have had it and that once you've had it and gotten over it, you're no longer at risk for contracting again, right? So if you now encounter someone, if you've had the, the coronavirus, you encounter someone who has it, you're not going to get sick from them, and so you're not going to spread it. Only that person who is currently sick is going to spread it. Once you get to levels high enough, then it will be you, it may be present, it may, there may be coronavirus around, but there aren't any people left to actually spread the virus. Right now it's novel, no one's ever had it, so everyone's susceptible to it. But at some point, people who've had it and gone through it, they just aren't going to spread anymore, and so it will greatly decelerate the spread of the virus. The concern, of course, is that since it has some fairly significant effects and, you know, causes people to have respiratory failure, heart failure, uh, that it will overwhelm the healthcare system. And you're seeing that in Italy. And so you if you have everybody getting it all at once, because of course it's totally novel and it can spread easily, uh, that you're going to flood the healthcare system and everyone's going to, and it's going to collapse the system. You're going to have, you know, dermatologists running ventilators, uh, in ICU work where they haven't done since medical school and really I'm just, probably most medical students didn't do that anyway. Uh, and so that's the main concern. And so that's where you hear people talk about flattening the curve and you have, you hear this talk about you want to have the spike not be very dramatic where you have everybody get it at once, but you have people, everybody get it, but it's over a long course. So that kind of is one of the things I've been thinking about uh, when it comes to the United States. Like, you know, we have had now fairly draconian, shutdown of everything, restaurants, bars, all kinds of organization gatherings, uh, you know, all those sort of medical things as far as elective procedures. And this is in, in light of very few people having it that we know of. I mean, I realize that there are probably 10 times people who have it who, you know, don't know they have it, but even that is still pretty small numbers in, in the United States. Uh, so what that means is that you've, your herd immunity is actually relatively low you almost need to find a sweet spot, right? You almost need to have more people infected to get sort of push the healthcare system to the brink, but not over. And then you need to uh, kind of somehow maintain that slow burn where everyone's getting infected, but at a sort of a slow rate. How you sort of coordinate that and shut everything down or limit sort of social interactions, having schools closed, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, that's really the tricky thing, right? Because if you do it too much too soon, like you shut everything down, well, you're just kind of delaying when it's going to happen because if you give too few people who've had it, uh, you're going to get to a point where you're at some point it's going to get out again and you either have to resume normal activity or you're going to have to continue having these draconian um, responses. 
I don't know how you you can know these things unless you actually know how many people have it. And we don't have widespread testing, which is mainly the fault of the federal government and the CDC, FDA, uh, in that they are preventing the use of the, the innovation development of test testing. They insisted on having all the coordinate all centrally, which is why you don't want a centralized system in general. You it, it's much better to have a more robust uh, system that can be innovative and come up with other solutions. You had other places, uh, institutions that were coming up with a test that, that could uh, results back in hours versus many days. That was the original test in the United States. Um, so one of the problems, of course, has been the testing. So you don't know who has it. And so we don't have an idea for, you can't track the disease and see if there are lots of people who are suddenly spiking. Because you could imagine, you could say, hey, we're looking at this area and there's a lot of people who have it suddenly. There's a spike in this locality, let's say Chicago. So then Chicago says, we're going to shut down our schools. We're going to limit gathering. We're going to limit travel, et cetera to slow the progression a little bit, allow that sort of the, this area to recover. And then you, then you sort of ease the restrictions back. You almost have to have an amping and restricting because ultimately with a virus like this, there are only a few options. You can prevent it from ever catching hold. So if you were to say, we're going to prevent all kinds of travel, have the draconian measures and never allow anyone to get it. And then it would just go away. That is a possibility. The problem is it's all over the world. And at this point, it's almost impossible to get, get to a point where you're going to, limit the disease to ever get to a, or limit the virus to spread. And so in that case, you can't really, you can't really prevent people from getting it. So you can do all the social distancing, you can do everything you want, but essentially at this point we're we're going to get it. And until we have a decent percentage of the population, it's unknown if that's 30%, if that's 50% or 60% have to get it at some point in order to get that herd immunity for the overall population so that it doesn't spread massively all the time that's sort of where we have to get to. And until you get to those numbers, you're not at those numbers. And so then you you have the potential for many outbreaks all the time. Uh, and so if you do too much too soon, you're just basically delaying what's going to happen in two months. But now you've economically crippled yourself. You've done all these things that are going to get the population upset. Uh, you know, we have these, not martial law, but severely restricting people's access, their way of living, et cetera, et cetera. Now you're going to have a situation where you really need to do these things again, and people are going to be much less likely to follow you know, instructions or to want to go down that road again where they close their restaurants and they lose their livelihood. Maybe before they were almost bankrupt, and now you have them open for four weeks, and you say, okay, you're going to be closed again for two months. Now that restaurant's finished, all the people who work there and depended on that for a living are you know wiped out, and now you've got a bigger social problem on your hands. And so you are somewhat... I understand why things happen and, it, and it's because of political reasons. You know, one governor shuts down the state and so you feel compelled as a neighboring state to close your schools because what are you not responding, responding appropriately to the, the crisis, but you also are at risk for uh, doing it too soon. And then you're just, you're going to prevent something that's not really going to be much of a crisis for a little while. And then when you eventually, at some point you have to release the, the hold on things then maybe you're going to get your giant spike and you will have not generated much immunity in your community beforehand. And so it will still be just as bad as if you had never done anything the first time, except now you'll be in a position where it's going to be a lot more difficult politically to suddenly shut things down again. I don't know what the right answer is. And again, I think the, the problem is you can't know, you can't know when to do that because we have no testing and we, you almost need to test tons and tons of people have a good idea where it is in the community, have it cheap and available uh, and we just don't have that at this point. And, and b because of a lot of bureaucratic bumbling and regular regulatory hurdles that we're unable to overcome early, we've, we've sort of slowed the, the rollout of the testing and it's, it's make it harder for people who are trying to develop policy to make the pro appropriate policy and the correct m move. And so I think right now, my guess is uh, if you look out at the West coast where it's certainly a little bit worse in Seattle area, it had been in the community for a number of weeks, and there were some areas that, that were highly concerning. Uh, there were some nursing homes that they just, you know, weren't, a, they, they clearly were poorly um, monitoring, or they, you know, there's one of the doctors that was basically shut down saying, you're not allowed to do this testing anymore. Uh, but even so, it's not like the West Coast is totally overrun and collapsing the healthcare system, and they are a couple weeks ahead of most of the country. So you almost wonder if it would have been better for the rest of the country to just go another week or two and let it sort of spread a little bit more, get that get a little bit higher level of 
penetration rate, then shut everything down. And then hopefully you'll have gotten enough uh, herd immunity or maybe you get the population up to 30% or 40%. And it, and so when you get the next, when you re- ease everything back and then still people could be infectious, the amount of people where it could act, who could actually spread it would be much less. Um, so I, I tend to think we've sort of shot, um, shot things off a little too soon, but again, that's, you know, pure speculation. And this may be, this may evergreen poorly <laughs> in just a week or so, as I'm saying this here on uh, Tuesday, March 17th. But I do think it's something to keep in mind. I think that's something that, um, the only, the only argument you can make for the, the plan now is if you say, well, we're going to hold things back for three, four five months. We're going to just prevent gatherings and all kinds of social interactions because we know that we're going to get some effective antiviral treatments or we know we're going to get some effective vaccinations that are going to be coming online in the next couple of months. So then we can get that herd immunity and get everyone vaccinated uh, to prevent an outbreak in a couple of months. The problem, of course, with that is that that's not the case it, with certainly with the with the uh, regulatory <laughs> burden as it works in this country and trying to run trials and things, it, it would take far longer than that to, to ever be approved. Um, you know, maybe they could re- ease some restrictions, but even the physical limitations of trying to develop a vaccine and produce enough to produce enough doses to be meaningful is going to take time and probably more time than we have that we can just sort of shut the country down. The other concern, of course, is that this is a virus that will mutate and that will get immunity this year and then next year you can still it'll come back around again and it'll we'll have the same problem you cannot continue having a society that shuts down every few every year for three months uh, it's just it's it's just not possible it's going to cause too much political and economic strife and there'll have to be a better solution my hope is that just the, the vaccinations will be able to to stem this and keep this to a disease that will be something that will look at as a craziness in 2020 uh, and then it maybe it's bad in 2021 but then it's sort of like the flu where it's just around and you know you vaccinations are f- partially effective my hope is too that it, it'll be it'll mutate less than influenza and then we'll have less strains to try and vaccinate against and our vaccinations will be more effective that would be my expectation since it tends to be um more lethal and it tends it seems like more things diseases that are more lethal tend to be a little bit easier to vaccinate against or at least control but you know that's again just speculation i'd now like to introduce you to aaron pomerantz of life liberty and the pursuit of snarkiness a great podcast where we're going to discuss coronavirus covid19 what it means and what the implications are for our personal liberties as well enjoy so in an example of how quickly things can go from zero to 120 miles an hour societally, coronavirus has seemingly overnight almost gone from something we kind of make jokes about and we, we think is a problem with people across the ocean to something that is causing, I don't think it's unfair to call, to, to call a mass panic. I don't think it's unfair to call it a mass panic. Because, uh, at least personally, uh, we went to the grocery store yesterday and there is genuinely no toilet paper. Milk and bread is out. People are buying eggs. People are stockpiling ammunition. There's just... I look outside and I'm surprised I don't see Raccoon City from the Resident Evil series, frankly. (laughs) So, in that light, uh, we're doing a special episode on, on the topic of how people relate to mass panics like disease. And as always, how the government doesn't tend to respond the best way, or at the very least, certain actors within the government uh, don't respond the best way. And in that spirit, we've got Dr. Eric Larson on the podcast again. He's the practicing anesthesiologist and uh, host of the Paradox podcast. And clinical assistant professor at Michigan State University. So, Eric, thanks again for coming on. Thanks for having me on, Aaron, and uh, hard to believe we're doing this again so soon. Yeah, no, it, it comes like a thief in the night, or a, uh, insert coronavirus-related joke here. <laughs> so just fundamental, first-level question. Um, what Do you think people are overreacting to this or not? Yeah, I think that's the 
the most important question, but it's probably also the hardest one to answer because I think at this point we fundamentally don't know what we're dealing with. Uh, when it comes to the math question, we don't really know what the denominator is, and by that I mean we don't really know how many people have this and what the lethality is. We don't really know what the mortality rate is, or quite frankly, I've not seen any discussion about what the morbidity rate is. And it's important to keep track of the possibility of long-term effects from this virus. Because when we look at other things like adenovirus or rhinovirus, which are you know commonly known as the cold, uh, we don't worry about lethality. We don't even really oftentimes worry about morbidity, but it's highly contagious and it's something that is ubiquitous. Uh, it's there all the time. It tends to get worse in times when we're more confined indoors, like during the winter. And and really, until we have a better feel for what we're dealing with as far as the actual numbers, it's hard to know what bad panic is or if it's good panic. And so I think, you know, when you look yeah. at things now, it might be more of like a low-grade hysteria that I would say we're having right now. <laughs> but whether that's warranted or not is hard for me to answer. I think it's important that we recognize that there are some serious problems in other parts of the world, like you look at northern Italy, certainly what's happened in Southeast Asia, and there's some real problems. Definitely as lethal if you're older, you're more susceptible, but that's very similar to the flu in the sense that the flu is going to be much more likely to kill someone or cause significant problems if you're older or weak in some way, uh, immunocompromised, like someone who's a transplant patient. And so it's some things should be taken seriously. But how seriously and to the, what extent we have to actually worry about it, it's hard to know exactly. Yep. I mean, one of the things that I find very interesting is, you know, what people do in response to this and what their go-to sort of items that they go to the grocery store and purchase. A toilet paper seems like a strange thing because, you know, what are you going to do with toilet paper? Uh, also pasta. So it seems like people in an event of a crisis or apocalypse, they tend to eat spaghetti and also, uh, bread and I guess people eat lots of sandwiches and so I I'm not quite sure there doesn't seem to be any rhyme or reason to you know what people are purchasing and so in that sense I think it's probably there's some panic uh, and how much that really matters or what that ultimately means is anyone's guess but on the other hand I'd like to point out too that I don't think social distancing avoiding large crowds avoiding spaces with lots of people is, in good stores and theaters and those sorts of things is actually irrational and hysterical. I think that's a reasonable prevention of spread of disease to yourself and your family. Yeah, I, I did go to the movies yesterday and I deliberately did pick a time that was going to be empty anyway, based on my experience with that theater. But I was genuinely shocked at just how few people were there for anything. I, I went to see The Hunt uh, for an upcoming episode and I was like, oh yeah, I mean, I'm going at like 2 p.m. on a Friday at a very dingy little movie theater. No one's going to be seeing this movie, especially not in rural Oklahoma, but well, suburban on the edge of rural Oklahoma. Uh, but then like no one was there even for the relatively big movies, though I guess a lot of those have now been canceled and I haven't been keeping up with which ones those are. But yeah, I, pe people definitely seem to be taking the self-isolation bit seriously, which I think is kind of cheering, frankly. Yeah, I think it's important for people to distance themselves. I mean, for libertarians, I think this is great because, you know, we tend to be introverts and so it's easier for us to socially distance ourselves from other people. <laughs> but I think it's important too that we recognize that that when it comes to this whole response, it hasn't been just a central authority that's been sort of laying down the law, so to speak. We have had what is really, for the most part, private actors who are working. I mean, yes, we've had Trump declare a national state of emergency. A number of cities have, obviously states. Government schools have been shut down. But most of these things occurred actually after private actors took over. And so you saw like the NCA or uh, cancel the NCA tournament, which is what where I, my family and I were in Indianapolis to, to watch Big Ten tournament. So all this stuff sort of happened when we were there. Uh, but you saw the NBA, other sports leagues, all shut down their operations You've seen private venues like concerts and, you know, other gatherings like symphonies and all those sorts of things closed down as well, churches. And so what's, I think, heartening is that it's been mostly private actors who are doing these things. Now, are they overly cautious? Possibly. But again, the hard thing for us to know is really what the, the math is. Again, what the denominator is, what the real risk is for people. Is it 3%? Is it 0.1%? Uh, 
Uh, it's hard for us to know at this point because to try and compare across health systems, you know, medications and treatments, you know, we don't really know really what we're dealing with. And so until we know those things, it's going to be really difficult for us to know what the proper response is. And, and I worry that, you know, we will probably never know until maybe when it's all done. And uh, then you say, well, either we overreacted or we didn't pay enough attention. And and I think, you know, you're you're sort of left with that unknown to try and figure out what the actual risk is. And that's something that in general people are not very good at. And so in that extent, it's really hard for people, I think, to determine what is the appropriate response to prepare for this. I mean, you know, most people are not preppers, and so they're not storing months supply of food in their basement. And they are going out and about their business thinking, well, I'm still going to have access to the outside world. I can still get things. But there are probably things I need to prepare for. My kids are home from school now, and that's in the case in ours. And I think most states at this point, most states have shut down. And so, you know, what do you what do you do, and and how do you sort of move forward through something that no one has ever dealt with before? This is very even different than I would say 9/11, which uh, was a one-time event, but it also didn't encompass the. It, there wasn't a local impact. It was just something that was national. So, you know, you, people respond different ways. Yeah, it's been interesting to me to see some of that because, I mean, we didn't do much prepping. I'm not really much of a prepper, uh, though I guess that depends on who you ask. I do have, like, medical gear and stuff like that that people sometimes look at me strangely for having. But like, why do you need chest seals? And I'm like, I hope I never need chest seals, but I have them. But, you know, we, we, we went to get our stuff yesterday, a couple of days ago. We fortunately had already stuffed up on toilet paper. And, yeah, you're right. There, There's... There's the sensible level of things to buy and like non-perishable food supplies in case you do have to isolate yourself, which is what my wife and I are planning for. It's like if we get sick, we are not leaving the house for two weeks. If one of us gets sick, we are not leaving the house for at least two weeks. That's just good safety. So we'll need food for two weeks. We should have that. We should have that ability uh, and not have to like order a pizza and like slip out money via, you know, uh, with, with gloves on or something. Uh, but like like the toilet paper thing doesn't make much sense to me. Uh, there seems to be, you, I think you used the, the phrase low level mass hysteria. And I like that idea because on the one hand, people are taking sensible precautions, but then when they're going after toilet paper or as much milk as they can buy, I, we saw people with like, it looked like almost every gallon of milk in the store. And I'm like, you do realize milk is perishable. It's one of the fundamental truths of milk. But there definitely seems to be some group polarization. And I mean, you know, we normally think of group polarization in terms of like group decision making, uh, bad decision making. You know, one person has an idea, then another person agrees with the idea. It ends up being very extreme and it's sh risky shift. It's also called, you know, the original decision was maybe a, maybe a four on the risk scale. The end result is a nine or a 10. And it's definitely underlying mass panic because people are going, oh, you know, there's no more toilet paper. And I saw the memes, but then I'd see, and I saw the photos online, but then that wasn't really true for my experience going to Walmart in Norman, Oklahoma. And then we go, and now it's true here because everyone's feeding into everyone and everyone's going, oh my gosh, everyone's buying toilet paper. I should buy it too. And I have, like you said, I have no idea what you're going to use toilet paper for during if, should you contract COVID-19, like, unless you, unless your idea of fun during isolation is pretending you're a mummy. Like, <laughs> yeah, I don't know. I wonder sometimes if maybe people are planning, is it uh, bridal showers or baby showers where you sort of make dresses or something out of toilet paper? I've never been invited to those things, so I'm not sure, but I, I haven't quite understood the whole concept of the toilet paper, but I think it's, the nice thing is, is things will figure themselves out here pretty soon, I think, and then those things will be available again. So if you didn't get your hands on some toilet paper, I wouldn't worry too much because I'm sure there's only so much toilet paper someone could use, and then it'll be available. It's not the perishable goods because the perishable ones, I can understand more that you would want to stock up on some of those, but definitely the things that are non-perishable are things you think people would be much more inclined to grab and ahead of time. But it didn't. It, again, it comes down to the question of, what is the real risk for this? And I think people are very bad at determining risk. Um, you look at uh, rates of trauma and death from trauma over the past 30, 40, 50 years, and it really hasn't changed a whole lot. 
which is unusual because you look at the world and overall it's much safer with seatbelts, helmets, all sorts of different safety devices in place. And yet people still are dying all the time because I think people just have a different risk tolerance. And, and not only that, but I think the, even determining the risk is very challenging because we don't really know what the sensitivity and specificity of the testing is. I mean, what is the real rate of infection? What is until we have widespread testing of people and then have an idea for what exactly is the likelihood that this test is going to be positive? If you are, say, positive for the the virus, uh, likewise, if you're you know, negative, are you really negative? Uh, these things we really don't know, and and I think there are lots of different tests, and it's hard for us to get a handle on you know what <laughs> what the right answer is for all this stuff and. And unfortunately, it's sort of a discussion in some ways of things we just don't know. And until we know more, which my guess is you're not going to know more until this is sort of mostly over, uh, you're just kind of, it's a shot in the dark. And so on some level, the low-level hysteria that people are exhibiting is not irrational in the sense that I think, you know, until we really know the numbers, you don't really know how you should appropriately respond to things. Yeah, that's something that's been... Uh, very much on my mind is uh, the, the sensitivity versus specificity, which is that idea of the denominator you brought up. And, you know, I always mention this when I teach statistics, uh, you know, how, how just because you test positive for something doesn't mean that you have it because you have to look at the number of false negatives versus false positives. You have to look at th th there are numbers you're not considering generally. So even with something like a pregnancy test that works 99 percent of the time, you have to think, it's like, well, what does that 99% refer to? That refers to identifying you as pregnant when you're actually pregnant. Well, let's look at things like false positives. And, and then you come to realize that there's still a really good chance you don't have a disease or you're not pregnant, et cetera, even if you get a, a positive test. And it's the similar principle here with, you know, okay, well, what's the morbidity? How, 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 what percent of people die when they get it? Uh, how many people get infected? I'm like, yeah, but we don't, we're, we're missing some really vital information that could either tell us, this isn't something to worry about. This is like Ebola or SARS, well, back which is a long time ago now. SARS was uh, at least the mass panic about it, uh, which I, I frankly it was so long ago. I think I was like eight. Uh, yeah, but then we, but then I'm like, well, yeah. If, if on the other hand, it could be you know, if if only two percent of people get it that and uh, that get it die, but it affects like thirty percent of the population or something. That's a whole lot of dead people. And I, I think that's an important part that now people, people aren't like considering that even as they're getting worried, I don't think. I think a lot of people are getting worried because they're told to get worried. They're not trying to, to sit down and understand this. And, and that, that's what worries me because uh, in, in the health psychology field, uh, people, it, it's, it's, generally, it's a general truth of psychology uh, overall that people just make bad decisions and that's why we study them. We don't, we, we don't, there's the positive psychology movement where let's study the good side of humanity. Uh, and it's like, yes, that's, that's fine. But most psychologists, especially social psychologists, which is a very broad field involving health psychology and stuff like that. Uh, we like to study people because we see something going wrong. And when it comes to health psychology, yeah, people just, people make bad decisions. And, and, and even when that, Bad, they make say a good decision it's often for a bad reason and you know thinking of something like the flu which isn't that serious in the grand scheme of things but it still kills a lot of people uh, we see that a lot of people don't get the flu vaccine because they just go oh well you know that's that, that's for old people i don't need they don't understand what it is the flu vaccine does they don't understand the the social benefits to getting it and that they won't be killing their parents or their grandparents potentially uh, they think that they they have this illusion of uh, invulnerability. There are all sorts of bad decisions made. On the other hand, people sometimes just go straight to panic. Uh, so there's there's so many bad decisions people can make for so many interesting and diverse reasons. And obviously, this is novel coronavirus, right? So we haven't done any research on it yet, though I'm, I'm sure I am not the only one who is currently preparing a research packet, especially because... I agree with you. I don't think we're going back to school this semester, most likely. Uh, so people still need research credits, so may as well run them online. Uh, but as we're, as we're, I would not be surprised if these findings mirror the findings we found with things like measles or something like that, which is where people get panicked initially, but then when it doesn't hurt them, then they just go right back to, oh, it wasn't that bad. 
And so that's what worries me about a lot of this is kind of the the human decision, the human factor, the, the decision making of human beings, uh, especially with something dangerous. We are not good decision makers when it comes to our own health or our own vulnerability to anything, really. Yeah, that I mean, just gets back to the, the point that it's really difficult for us to figure out what the risk is, and and people have different tolerances of risk. Some people are much riskier than others, and they're willing to to do things that are that someone else would think is crazy and they would not even consider, you know, you could have imagined someone who's going out and, um, driving 120 miles an hour. And for them, that seems totally reasonable, uh, where someone else is thinks that their risk tolerance is much higher. And so, uh, or much lower, excuse me. And they would just say, there's no way I'm going to do something like that. I would, I'm not going to jump up an airplane. I'm not going to go rock climbing without a harness, those sorts of things. And so, so that's why you have this, I think, real variation on how people respond to the, to this crisis. And, and for the, by the same token, I think, you know, as you said, it's hard for people to, to assess the risk. And so then they, they can get a false sense of security um, where they think, well, I'm totally healthy and fine. And, and also a failure to recognize that they are a vector for disease. They can spread it. And even, yeah, they might be that 90% that are totally fine or 95%. That's totally fine. I mean, if you're a kid for the most part, Hardly any kids have died from this at all, which is, makes it a little bit unusual for a virus, uh, especially like even the flu tends to strike young children as well. Now, maybe that's because more kids are contracting the influenza at this point, and there just haven't been as many, because really the COVID has not affected as many people as you have seen from like the flu. Uh, so maybe it's not as bad, but my, our, my suspicion is, especially when you see the response in other countries, is that it's much worse. Uh, but it's, it's a novel disease, and so no one's seen it. There's no immunity to it. Uh, that'll probably change over time. But essentially, you're going to have people who are going to make decisions with the information they have, sometimes really good and sometimes really bad, which is always flavored by their prior experiences, their current condition, what they're hearing from their friends and you know other sources of information. And you know, oftentimes, those are bad decisions or ones that are maybe would seem from someone else like totally irrational, but for them seems perfectly reasonable. And so anyway, as you know, from a psychological standpoint, there's all kinds of reasons people make decisions and not all of them are the best. Yeah. And then there's also the fact that people will make decisions uh, really badly when they think there's a benefit. So like whether you frame something in terms of loss or gain really has a predictive power for how they choose to dis make a decision. So when you have you know, the, the steps being suggested for dealing with coronavirus, one of the biggest ones is social isolation. And unfortunately, even though we do live in an age of Hulu and Netflix and pick your streaming service, Disney Plus, whatever. Um, and we have, I mean, we're, we're doing this right now via Zoom. We're, we're not really socially isolated the same way we might have been back in the 19th century with tuberculosis or something like that. But people are still, they are still isolated. They are still not talking to people face to face, there is that sense of loss. And so if they see a 50, 50 shot in terms, well, there's a 50% chance I won't get the virus. This won't hurt anyone, but there's this, you know, you can give people like the slightest chance. I mean, this is, this explains why people play roulette, right? Like that, the, as long as like, well, you know, I could go out and I could see people again, or I could go, I want to go to see this concert. And, and that's the thing that it's changed for right now, but even as little as three or four days ago, it, this, people were still talking like this and I worry it's going to happen again. Uh, oh, well, you know, I, I think people are overreacting and I'm not, you know, there's a, there, there's a, there's a big chance I'll get it, but there's also a chance I won't. And the, the gain I'm going to get by going outside and breaking CDC recommendations, I, I worry what implications that has for decision making regarding health here, because we've already seen it have really terrible ones for other issues like measles, flu, coronary heart, coronary heart. That's a that's a that's a tautology, coronary disease, etc. So yeah, I'm I'm not again. It's the human factor here that worries me almost more than the viral one. Yeah, I think there's some truth to that, and and I think the important thing to remember with this disease we'll call it in this pandemic, which is clearly is, uh, is that we are looking to flatten the curve. And you've heard this term a lot. And, you know, what does that really mean? It, it essentially means that it, that even if this is, a, say, on a disease that's not terribly lethal, but if everyone's contracting it at all at the same time and people tend to all experience uh, 
severe respiratory distress all at the same time, you're having a you're going to have an overloaded healthcare system. And where that really comes into play is at a time right now where you see we're just still getting over the flu. And although most people don't aren't thinking about this, the flu season puts lots of people in the hospital. And and by that reason, if we're now adding a new stress of a novel disease that's bringing as many or more people into the hospital, we have a system that's not able to, to handle it. And I don't know if that's exactly the case that's going on in, in Italy and other places in the world, if they're also dealing with the flu and then trying to deal with coronavirus on top of that. Uh, so it's important for us as a society or whatever to try and think of ways to minimize all people hitting at the same time in in the um, in the healthcare system because you just there's just not enough you know bed space or ventilators and support. If you slow it down and have the same amount of people come in, but instead of having it all over three weeks, you have it over three months. Now you've made it so we can probably get through this okay. And yeah, there's going to be all the same morbidity mortality, I suppose, but maybe less in the sense that you're going to be able to treat people better. You're not going to have to triage people and say, you know, you're you're too sick and we just only have so many ventilators, your chance of surviving is a lot less. I mean, it's very much like a war in where you have to triage people and say, you know, you've lost a foot so we can save your life and just, you know, put a trinket on and you're going to pull through versus someone's got massive internal injuries and you're like, well, we just don't have the resource, the time or the the hospital space to take care of you. You're just such a li- low likelihood of surviving that we're just going to let you go. These are not decisions that any healthcare person wants to take care of, you know, a physician or nurse or whoever's in the triage at that time. I mean, that's like a nightmare scenario where you are basically like in a war zone and it and it shouldn't be that way. But you're hearing those stories from Italy. I'm not sure if I've heard those stories elsewhere, but I think that's the, I mean, that's the real risk. That's the real fear that it gets to that point. And that becomes real, you know, that's, that's real, a real problem. And if that ever happens, then I'm not sure exactly how people respond to that and if they'll be okay with it. I know that someone who's used to taking care of people and having kind of unlimited resources, you feel that way as a physician, that there aren't a whole lot of people that you can't save outside the ones who just can't be saved. You know, someone who's so far gone that really even extraordinary Herculean efforts, which we usually do for about everybody, you know, would, would not work for someone. Uh, but now you'd actually making decisions, you know, rationing sort of decision at that time saying, well, we've got 25 people who are coming in uh, who are sick. And so we can only help the top 15. It's really hard to say, you know, those 10, you're just out of luck. Uh, and that's not something that I think most of society will be okay with. I mean, it they'll be okay in the sense that that's going to be the way it's going to be. But I don't know that Americans are ready to make those decisions. And so for those reasons, it's important to try and do anything we can to prevent this from spreading too fast. Because I think the the one thing worry people have, of course, or the naysayers will say, well, this really isn't as bad as any worse than the flu, blah, blah, blah. Uh, I think that's pretty much been shown not to be the case. I mean, how bad it will get may depend on how much we mitigate the problems and flatten out the curve and those sorts of things. But uh, I think it's not unreasonable a lot of the Social distancing, I don't think, you know, we need National Guard out in the streets. But um, anyway, I think it's it's not an unreasonable response to start closing down large gatherings and things like that because, frankly, this is something that doesn't happen very often, and so it's probably the only way to seriously control this. Yeah. And speaking of overloaded health systems and some of the problems, one of the things, you know, I think it was Rahm Emanuel who said, never let a crisis go to waste. And that's something that, you know, Rand Paul has talked about it already. Uh, there's a great piece at Medium from uh, Hannah Cox that talks about, you know, crises are often used by the government to expand power. And we are, we're already seeing some of that, but we're also seeing, I think, overreactions to that. So this is, this is kind of one of those things like, what, what, you know, we, we talked a little bit about individual action, and I'm sure we'll come back to that. But I want to at least briefly talk about the government action and the actions the government's taking. Because uh, even though, I mean, on our last episode, Austin and I did go into why we don't like President Trump. We got a question about that from a fan. And we were obviously a- so, so we, we were obviously animated in our response. But, you know, there is such a thing as Trump derangement syndrome and, 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 and just calling him out for everything he possibly does. Uh, but on the other hand, you do want to hold government accountable. So, you know, he declared a state of emergency yesterday, a national state of emergency. Uh, I know that in Oklahoma, at least in Norman, our mayor also declared a state of emergency. And people are already going, the government doesn't have a right to do this. And you know, how dare the government like restrict travel? You know, Trump's already restricted travel internationally. He's, he said he may have to restrict it nationally. 
there may be legal impediments to large gatherings, et cetera, in an attempt to basically force social, social isolation and halt the spread of this disease. And on the one hand, that stuff to me just seems sensible. Again, we talked about this with, with when you were on about vaccines. Uh, the gov- one, of the, one of the government's jobs is to protect us. And when you have a pandemic, yeah, the government should be doing something. I, I, the government shouldn't just be there to say, oh, well, don't panic. And sometimes it's worth being scared, not panicking or acting out of pure fear, but being scared. But then on the other hand, you see things, uh, two real examples that have been in the news are the governor of California, uh, Gavin Newsom, just issued an executive order, I think it was on Thursday, saying that the, the excuse was they need to have procedures in place to get us through the next few months and make sure that the health system isn't overwhelmed. And obviously that's that's all well and good, but his executive order allows the state to take over hotels and hospitals if necessary. Uh, and, and it looks essentially like they'll be practicing a really int- uh, extreme form of ev- eminent domain in, in the course of doing this. A uh, similar thing happened in Champaign, Illinois which I mean, admittedly not exactly the biggest, uh, not, not exactly a, a thriving urban hub, <laughs> to put it mildly. But the mayor of Champaign, she gave herself the power to ban guns and alcohol sales. She declared a citywide emergency. And she said, you know, as, as long as we're combating coronavirus, she can also ban the sale of alcohol. Uh, well, I said alcohol already. She can also ban the sale of gasoline. She can cut off access to gas, water, electricity. And the city has the ability to, quote, take possession of private property or order the temporary closing of businesses. And it, doing some research into this, it does look like, again, it's a very extreme form of eminent domain. They can take your stuff and they may not have to give you money for it. And... There, I guess there's also, there's got to be a balance here. And how, how do you think we should react to that? Because on the one hand, we, we do want the government to take steps. But on the other hand, as we've seen with other crises in the past, be they health related or militarily related like 9-11, uh, the gov- when the government take these steps to address a crisis, you know, we just reauthorized the Patriot Act. Uh, these things don't go away. So how do we deal with that from your perspective? I think it's important to point out that most of the things that have happened outside of the school closings to this point have been voluntarily done. And so I think most private actors are, you know, res- responding appropriately, I think. And, you know, I think they're taking their cue from the federal government and from the state government saying, you know, this is a serious problem. We really would recommend you do these things. And these, uh, all these places are really shutting things down. So it, I think it, I think the, ne- the necessity to have extraordinary rules is probably not not necessary. <laughs> and it's important, I think, to to point out that when you look at, say, California, I think it's a good example. I mean, is it necessary to tell these hotels, hey, you've got to, you know, we got to quarantine or basically we're going to seize these hotels temporarily? Uh, you know, that's actually interesting. It almost reminds you of uh, what is the Third Amendment, uh, the Bill of Rights, which has actually never been adjudicated. But um, it would be interesting to, to know why these hotels would not let them anyway. Like I think most of these hotels are empty. So why would they not want a revenue source source? I think it'd be perfectly reasonable <laughs> for them to say, Hey, yeah, we'd love to have you use our hotel and, and use this to help people because, you know, we're not getting money anyway. Now, if it's just a way of the state to take it without even paying for it, then I think that's, you know, really wrong. I think there are other ways that I think there are other places, other ways the state could probably find that are voluntary and that I think most people would voluntarily help out. I'm, I'd be very surprised if there would be lots of places that would say you have to use government force in order to take these things. Now, when it comes to the a response like in Champaign, I think that's the, that's the other end of the spectrum. That's clearly someone who's had an agenda for a while, and they think, oh, this is my opportunity to you know, change the way society runs. I'm going to you know, make sure people aren't obese anymore, or they're not drinking, or you know, doing drugs, or having firearms. I mean, none of that has anything to do with coronavirus. I mean... It, if it if it had anything to do with the health the health standpoint, I think then you could say, well, that's a reasonable you know thing to do. If it's wartime and you're, you have no means of building creating ammunition, you say, well, we got to ration, and make sure we take all the you know copper or whatever it is. Now, I think you know there are free market solutions, all these sorts of things, but I mean, you, you'd at least could find some rationale for that thinking. Uh, but to say that we're just going to 
do whatever we want. And because it's a state of emergency, I can, you know, have dictatorial powers. It doesn't make any sense because if you get to a point where you say, well, now we need to make sure we, you know, cut down an X, Y, or Z, then you may have a rationale for it. And then you, then you pass it and you can do this through democratic means. I don't, I don't know why if you don't have people riding the streets and things like that, it's not like martial law. You should have to have these sorts of powers. And I think it's an excuse. I think it's dangerous. I think that's something we should push back against as much as we can. It's difficult in these sorts of times to sort of push back against that because black people, how could you, you know, dare do something that would, you know, impede our way of protecting ourselves. But that sort of thing is unwarranted and it, and it's nonsensical. It's just someone who clearly has an agenda that, I mean, doesn't surprise me in a college campus town. They tend to be very, very left-leaning and they have social engineering ideas. And so in that sense, I'm not surprised, but it's very concerning and, and clearly unnecessary and not related at all to a real health problem. Yeah, it reminds me of the, the way war is used. You know, we had, starting in the early 20th century or I guess some real extreme libertarians would say with Abraham Lincoln, because they just like doing that. Uh, there's the idea that, you know, the president in, the, in a state of war can enact severe measures. And then lo and behold, we enter the 20th century and especially the late 20th century, we start having wars on everything, war on drugs, war on crime, war on disease, war on pick whatever you want really and it's the same logic that comes through it's well it's a war and that justifies whatever i want that justifies whatever measures i have to take because this is this is desperate and we've seen this go disastrously with the war on drugs though apparently joe biden does not think that is true but you know whatever <laughs> uh, we've seen this go disastrously with the war on crime again attorney general barr doesn't think so but the numbers speak for themselves and it seems that now we're just going to have a war on disease. And based on every other arena these tactics have been tried in, the results will not be good. Because then again, it'll just become, well, if this is, a, this is a, enough of a crisis and your rights no longer matter for the good of the majority, we are doing this to you. And I also think it's really telling that, you know, oh, we have to take over hotels. Well, you have these government-owned schools that are now sitting empty. <laughs> yeah. You have a lot of government-owned buildings. The governments, whether at the state, federal, or local level, there are a lot of buildings. They have a lot of real estate. I'm like, I'm like even if I were going to grant that maybe this emergency would get severe enough, because obviously I don't have the medical knowledge to make that assumption uh, or assertion. Obviously, I don't have enough medical knowledge to make that assertion, but if I were going to grant it, I would definitely want them to be op offering up their own buildings first. I would take them far more seriously if they had already said, yeah, we're going to be turning schools into triage centers. We're going to be turning municipal buildings into triage centers. We're going to offer up all our own stuff first. But no, of course, it goes right to we need, we need to seize private property. And that's what I find really telling and frankly, really worrying. I think you have a reason to be worried about it, and I think it's and I think it's not unreasonable to be concerned about these things in the event of crisis. I mean, you can worry about the virus spreading, and you can also worry about the government encroachment this time. I think war and terror is a great example, right? We have this authorization to use of military force passed in what two thousand two, and you know, now suddenly you've got you've got justification for about anything the government does from a foreign policy standpoint for years, and and they would find ways of saying it's legal and whether it's spying on Americans, spying on foreigners, um, collecting data, it, all these sorts of things are justified based on this law that was passed a long time ago that really had very little, little to do with a lot of what their activities are now. <laughs> and I think it's important to look at that and say, Hey, this is something we need to be concerned about. We need it. We, and it's, it's this time when at the time when it's happening that you need to at least call the alerts. You may not be able to stop anyone from doing what they're doing, but you can say, hey, we need to really think about this so that you at least plant a seed, hopefully, in people's minds that we well, need a democratic process in the sense that we have to have buy-in from everybody that what we're doing makes sense and that it's actually achieving the goals that we're looking for. That's you know exactly the point of the California example. Uh, there are other ways to do it, getting this done without having to seize property, and I think we need to explore those first, and that's why we need to get input from everyone ahead of time. Yeah. Yeah, everything will become a crisis. Like, like Joe Biden said, I think two days ago when we were, as we were recording this, that as president, he would end vaping just 
at the overall just end vaping because it's a public health crisis. And I'm like, uh, having followed that research really closely, again, there's no consensus on this. Uh, and even if even if there was, even if it is categorically over overarchingly bad, you don't have the right to do that. But because we're it's a public health crisis, all of a sudden he'll have that right, and there will be, you know, yeah, like you said, uh, what what happens? I mean, he's not going to be president now. But hypothetically, if Bloomberg had become president, was he going to do that nationally with diet sodas or uh, giant sodas the way he did in in New York City? I mean, what's what's going to happen here? Uh, but on the flip side, you know, the CDC has made a number of recommendations, and I've seen some people who are just skeptical of this overall. Uh, I have a very good friend who's also a psychologist, uh, and she, she's, a social, she's a social psychologist, focuses more on politics, really specializes in conspiracy theories. I've been talking to her a lot about it, and she's fascinated with libertarians because she's not <laughs> one herself. She's a socialist, like an out-and-out -out socialist. So she's just, you know, couldn't be any more different than me politically. So we talked to each other about these things and we've been talking about conspiracy theories and she's like, what do you think the libertarian would response would be? And I always want to rep us really well. And then I go to like libertarian boards or, and I go, oh, <laughs> yeah. and some of the responses I've seen are, well, the CDC is a government agency. You can't trust them. This is all overblown. They're trying to make us panic. I'm not going to socially isolate. For my own sanity, I'm trying to convince myself these people are a minority. But at least from my perspective, as a com almost completely naive medical, you know, medical, I'm almost completely naive medically. I don't know a lot about it. I don't have to be a pain in the butt. Uh, <laughs> it all seems very rational to me. It's the, the CDC regulations. They, it seems like these are just common sense recommendations for, for public health. And do you think people should subscribe to those and follow them? Yeah, I mean, I think when it comes to the CDC recommendations for the coronavirus, again, we don't know a whole lot about it. We're not exactly sure. I mean, it's, we can have ideas of how it's transmitted, and it's sort of like any other virus, uh, it's from droplet. Yeah. Um, so I think, you know, common sense things are tend to be ones that are ones that you should follow. I mean, wash your hands. Don't contact people if you can help it. If you're exposed to someone who is, you know, again, protect yourself. If you're sick, stay away from work. Uh, these are things that would help prevent the common cold transmission as well. We just don't care about it as much because it's ubiquitous and it doesn't kill people. It doesn't, I mean, aside from maybe making you miss work for a day or so, uh, I, you know, we don't worry about this. It, that's why we always worry about the, during flu season that if you've got some of the flu, you stay home, right? I mean, these are things that, that we that we worry about because they can cause significant morbidity or at least, you know, loss of work time. I mean, I think when you look at the flu, that's a good example. So, I totally understand why people don't are skeptical of the government because I am oftentimes as well. However, just because it's from the government doesn't give you reason to, to always be skeptical of everything that comes out of it because, frankly, sometimes the government has lots of good things that it's, that it's doing. And so for that reason, I think it's important to sort of be skeptical but also rational. And, and you can hold both these opinions at the same time. I know it's difficult sometimes, but you have to just recognize that that the government's composed of individuals, they have their own motivations, their own biases, and maybe they're not always to the to the extreme that you would see, or they they don't view the world as you would. Uh, but they're not always. I would say, in general, the government, our government at least, is not out to get us. Um, and although it may be incompetent and buffoonery, sometimes it it takes over <laughs> when you look through our leaders. Perhaps uh, you don't. I don't think you always necessarily have to think that everything that comes out of the government is a lie. Uh, I think it's reasonable to question it, but to also just use your own reason and say, okay, so does it make sense you should wash your hands and avoid people? Yeah, probably so, if you don't want to get a, a disease, unless you think that there's not actually a disease process and that there's actually not viruses, they don't exist. I mean, I don't know who, anyone who would say that it's not a good idea to wash your hands. I, I think you have to be kind of crazy or someone who's... Uh, just a contrarian for no good reason to say that I'm not going to do any of these things, which are absolutely common sense. And so most of what the CDC set has put out are, I think, common sense. There are some other issues that have the CDC in their response to, the res to this with the testing and things like that. But as far as those things, yeah. makes sense. Yeah, I mean, to me, it just speaks of reactants and the difference between being anti-authoritarian and reactant is you know being anti-authoritarian means that sensible skepticism like i i am 
I've exhibited it today. Like I, I am very skeptical that the government needs the right to practice eminent domain. I don't think it has that right period. I'm just skeptical of that as a necessary health outcome. But I'm not, my automatic response when someone suggests something, especially, you know, the CDC or the FDA, I may look at the specific recommendations and try to see what, how sensible they seem from my very naive perspective. But I'm not going to automatically go, well, the government told me to do something and that means I should do something else. <laughs> yeah. one, one of those is sensible and, 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 and intellectually engaging yourself. And the other one to me just seems like it's just as dumb as buying everything the government says. You know, if we think that's dumb, well, just blindly rejecting it, especially when the entire purpose of the CDC is actually a valid use of government, assuming you believe there is such a thing, which I do, uh, then maybe you should at least think about that because it's not like in what way is this gaining control of you to make, say, hey, maybe wash your hands and don't hang out with people for a couple of weeks and try to avoid large gatherings because that's just basic germ theory. <laughs> like, Yeah, I totally agree. And I think, I think the... <laughs> The skepticism is not necessary in in on some level, and so I think it's important to to look at the, the guidelines and then just to practice some basic things, right? Like, I mean, you know, if you're an old person or if you know someone who is elderly, like your parents or grandparents, help them sort of quarantine themselves, help them avoid large crowds. I would say, make sure you get the, all their supplies to them. Say, hey, I need, to, I can go get to the grocery store. I can go get your, you know, whatever it might be, your dry cleaning, although I don't know who's elderly people are using dry cleaning, but, um, and then, uh, you know, some people are absolutely going to have to be exposed to this virus and you want to try and make sure that they're protected as much as possible. And I mentioned that because I'm one of those people, cause I'm going to be in, you know, in fact, more likely to be infected than most people because I'm going to be around it all the time. And anyone who's in the healthcare uh, business, whether that's a physician or a nurse. And so you look at the SARS virus when it hit in Canada, and those are the people who were most affected by SARS. They were about half of them, I think, were were healthcare workers. And so I think it's important to keep track of those people and to protect them. Uh, and then, you know, when you're coming to doctor's appointments, you know, just postpone them unless it's urgent. I would just say, hey, I'm just going to wait and come back in four weeks or six weeks or eight weeks or whatever. Uh, it's tough if they have been waiting a long time, but I think you just postpone those visits from emergency standpoint. You know, don't go to the emergency room for anything unless you absolutely have an emergency. A lot of the ER visits are like ear infections or runny nose or, you know, mild abdominal pain. I mean, if you have an emergency like significant abdominal pain, you have respiratory distress, then absolutely go to the emergency room. But going and, and just sort of willy-nilly going to the doctor because you're like, I want to make sure I'm okay because I'm worried about this whole COVID thing. You're heading into sort of like the worst place you could be, right? If you want to get a test for COVID-19, probably sitting in a waiting room if you're totally healthy is not a good idea because there could very well likely be people who are actually sick there who have COVID-19 and you're just now putting yourself in exposure. It doesn't make any sense. And so don't do those things. I mean, those are kind of common sense to like, it's one thing to avoid crowds, but it's nothing to avoid crowds in places where people are really sick. It's like the worst place to be if you're healthy is in the hospital, right? Because that's with a bunch of sick people. So avoid that. Uh, and just, you know, help people when you can, wherever it might be. I think that's always important, not only just elderly, but whoever. If someone needs, if you're out, maybe you can get something for your neighbor. And then that's one less visit that everyone has to take. And so I think that's helpful. And finally, I'd say, you know, if you're looking for an excuse to stop smoking, this is a great opportunity because although there's nothing I've seen specifically about COVID-19 and smoking, Without a doubt, if you have underlying smoking uh, problem, then you're more likely to have respiratory issues when it comes to what, you know, if any sort of respiratory problems like the flu or bronchitis or um, asthma. I, by smoking, you just make the, the problem worse. And so I would imagine it'd be a great time to stop smoking and save yourself some money. Well, I mean, that seems like a great way to end the episode, actually, because that was going to be my last question was, uh, what steps do you think, like as a as a medical professional and someone who, you know, in some ways, I guess, can't really ever be off. The, you're at least in a profession that can't take a break the way, same way the rest of us can. Uh, how, what, what do you think people should do? And I think you covered that really nicely. You know, and just, like Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy, don't panic. Yeah, grab your towel. <laughs> and don't forget your towel. Who knows what it's good for, but it's probably good for something. Yeah, so. All right, Eric, well, thank you so much for coming on. Uh, I always appreciate it. Uh, Guys, do make sure to check out the Paradox podcast uh, if you haven't 
already. It's a great resource, whether you're in the medical field or if you're just a patient who's interested in knowing more about these things. Uh, it's, it'll be a eye-opening, if sometimes a little scary, I guess would be my, my view of it. Uh, some, it's, it's fascinating to see what goes on in the medical world. And, you know, I think one of the most important things you can do in a, in a situation like this with COVID-19 is be informed. So it's a great resource for you to be more generally informed about your medical stuff. Eric, once again, thank you so much for coming on. I really appreciate it. And it's good to hear that, you know, we don't need to panic. <laughs> Definitely not. But I think it's important to just be not aware, totally. vigilant. Concern. Yeah. D d dial it up to about three. Not, don't, don't dial it up to 11. Like the old terror warnings. I think it's maybe yellow or orange at this point, but not definitely red. I would also encourage people to listen to the show at theparadox.com. That's T-H-E-P-A-R-A-D-O-C-S. Uh, it's not all scary stuff. We definitely talk about healthcare solutions and ways of people using market solutions to solve problems in today's world, you know, highly regulated as it is. And so I think whether you're a physician or someone who just goes to the doctor from time to time. It's a great way to sort of find out that there's actually people doing the right thing and finding solutions to our problems. There you go. All right, guys, we will be back later this week with another episode. Do, stay, uh, stay healthy, stay safe, and we'll talk to you soon. Take care, guys. Thanks for listening to The Paradox. If you like what the doc is doing, please subscribe and leave a review on iTunes or Stitcher and share the show with your friends. Become a supporting listener to get access to special bonuses at patreon.com forward slash the paradox. Show notes can be found at theparadox.com. <laughs>